listening to this, I know that all these messages are just drifting out there in the darkness. Mr. Clark, you said uh, not too long ago that in terms of communications, we're still in the semaphore and uh, smoke stage. Would you put that in context, please? Well, as far as the home is concerned, we have TV and, uh, and uh, radio and telephone. Um, the, the telephone is the only way we can communicate outside yet. We get a lot of communication inwards through the radio and TV, but we're going to get devices which will enable us to send much more information to our friends who they'd rather see us, we'd rather see them, we have extend, exchange uh, picture, pictorial information, um, graphical information, data, books and so forth. What would the ideal communications device be in your eyes? Well, it would be uh, a high definition TV screen and a typewriter keyboard and through this you can exchange any type of information, send messages to your friends, which they can read at not long. They can wait. When they get up, they can see what message is coming in the night. Uh, you can call in through this any information you want, airline flights, price of things in the supermarket, books you've uh, always wanted to read, news you selectively, you can say, you'll tell the machine, I'm interested in such and such items, sports, politics, or so forth. And the machine will help the main central item and bring all this to you selectively. Just what you want, not all the junk that you have to get. You know, when you buy the two or three pounds of wood pulp, which is the daily newspaper, and say this is what is safe old policy for posterity, because the newspaper is on the way out, and we're not, we're not going to ship, ship all this tons and tons of paper around, and we all need this information. Well, if we have face to face communications from our home, does this uh, clue in with your slogan, commute? Do, uh, don't commute, commute. 
communicate? Yes, and uh, we are moving slowly, perhaps not, perhaps too slowly, towards this kind of world. This is the way we're going to solve the traffic problem, ultimately. Not by covering the world with concrete, but by getting rid of the traffic. And in the world of the future, travel will be for pleasure, not necessity. And how will this, uh, how will this sort of communication and travel for pleasure affect our social lives, do you think? In terms of, say, time zones. Well, at least, well, it's going to affect our social lives in many ways. Uh, as much as the automobile has done in the past, in many ways negatively, as much as the telephone has done in the past. You mentioned time zones, which are concerned in a country like the United States already, where you telephone from one coast to the other, and your friends may be asleep, or they may wake you up in the middle of the night. But in the global bit of the future, it could be like living in one small town, where at any time about a third of your friends are asleep, but you won't even know which third. So we may have to abolish time zones completely and all go on the common time, same time for everybody, which will cause all sorts of problems. When you first came up with the concept of communication satellites, uh, didn't many scientists think this was a pretty far out and unreasonable idea? Well, it was far out. It was 36,000 kilometers out. <laughs> but um, no, not at that time. This was 1945, and the V-2 rockets had arrived, and when my paper was published, the atomic bomb had been dropped. So at that time, people were prepared to accept almost anything. And I don't, think, I don't remember any negative criticisms. In fact, I don't remember any, any comments at all about the truth, but there's certainly no feeling this was nonsense. And t 10 years before, it would have been, but 1945, no. What do you see ahead in terms of, really far ahead in terms of communications? Well, the, th the thing that really interests me isn't so much human communications, but communications with other intelligences elsewhere. And this is the biggest unknown, of course, among the most exciting prospects. Will we ever pick up signals from space, radio signals or any other kind of signal? Everybody feels sure there must be all sorts of higher civilizations out there with tremendous technological capabilities and we'll be able to pick up their, uh, their signals, even if not being the dust, they just have tremendous power to play with. And I hope that I live to see the first reception of any signal from outer space. Do you think that you will? Do you think it's that close? It could happen tomorrow. Nobody knows. It could happen tomorrow. It might be an evening paper right now that someone has picked up the first signal. There have been several false alarms and people have thought they have done this the pulsars. People have found the pulsars for us. It's very rhythmic signals. They thought they might be artificial. This is very exciting. Um, you also talk about a wristwatch. A wristwatch radio. Well, Dick yeah, Tracy, telephone. of course, had this uh, many years ago. And the wristwatch telephone uh, it, you know, it will be technologically feasible very soon. And uh, so the telephone will no longer be sort of fixed in one place. It will be completely mobile, and this would again restructure society, and uh, of course it has, it has disadvantages as well as advantages, it means that anyone can get at you anytime you like, and of course you could switch off the calling sign, but then you have calling signal, but then you might have to explain later why it was switched off, but the advantages are so great, the number of thousands of lives are saved every year by such a thing, and that's, it seems to me, to override almost all of considerations. Thank you very much, Mr. Clark.